first, there was Sonia Sotomayor who went first. And uh, she's a little younger than me and she said, first you go to this wonderful law school, you do very well, you uh, graduate and then you work for the government, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, District Attorney's Office, then you work for a firm. You care about issues, but you're cautious about how you say them. And then you become a judge. And they turned to me. <laughs> and I said, first you represent the first lesbian feminist radical revolutionary accused of killing a cop you could find. That would be your first case on prime time. Then you uh, do every abortion case in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You speak out in the Boston Common. And for the final coup de grace, you marry the ACLU, and then you become a judge. <laughs> they didn't know what to say. That was federal judge Nancy Gertner telling us of one of the many wonderful and interesting stories in her book, In Defense of Women, Memories of an Unrepentant Advocate. Hello and welcome to the Educational Forum, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. I'm your host, Diane Sullivan. And In Defense of Women is the topic for today's show. In her earlier years, Nancy Gertner wanted to go into politics. She wanted to run for the Senate and one day, yes, be president. She attended Yale Law School and her dreams changed. She wanted to write. She wanted to be a professor. During those years in law school, the anti-war movement and the women's movement began. Law student Nancy Gertner planned to spend a few years in practice and then to teach, or so she thought. Her few years, well, they turned into 24 years of practice. We begin our journey with Judge Gertner after she has graduated from law school and begins her first case, which was the very famous Susan Sachs case. Susan being one of only eight women ever to be listed on the FBI's most wanted list. The Sachs case was uh, uh, involved a robbery in 1970. The anti-war movement had been largely nonviolent. And then around the 70s, the early 70s, when the war was not ending and the passions were rising, all of a sudden there were people across the country who were doing things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was explosives that were found in a townhouse on, in Greenwich Village, and it was suddenly taking a very different turn than civil disobedience. Yes. So, the, so Susan was charged with participating in a bank robbery, the State Street Bank and Trust Company in Brighton. Uh, there were five people involved, three men and two women. The two women were Susan, um, who was a Brandeis senior, and Kathy Power. And the, the idea was that they were going to rob the bank for the purpose of getting money for the anti-war effort. And there had been other banks that they had robbed uh, as well. Three people were in the bank. One was guarding the entrance, and one was in the switch car. Uh, the, when the robbery was over, they got into the switch car, but the man who was guarding the bank for them didn't realize the robbery was over, and he shot a police officer, a very uh, well-known police officer, in the back. So Susan was charged with not just robbery, but murder, felony murder. Um, I, uh, I didn't know her, although we probably were in the same demonstrations on the New Haven Green some years before. Um, but she figured that the, th the three men had been prosecuted and convicted, mm -hmm. and really very quickly. She figured she had no hope. This is not a great way to, a great vo you know, vote of confidence in a lawyer, but <laughs> she figured she had no hope, that there was no way that she was going to uh, uh, get out of this with her life. There was no death penalty, but she was surely going to get life imprisonment. And so it was, it, the story was that for her last moment on the stage, she wanted to be true to her values. And true to her values meant, uh, by that point, a woman lawyer and an all-woman team. Uh, I had never, ever expected that she was going to ask me. I had been a supporting player when the case was in uh, another, another city. So when she asked me, I write that I, you know, I, I didn't know how to say no. It was, it was very interesting. I mean, I said yes because I had to come to grips with my fears. Um, I, I, I just couldn't say no. I couldn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm afraid of doing this, or, oh, I don't have experience. I, I say in the book, I sort of told her I had no experience, but it was perfectly obvious. I mean, I was 29 <laughs> and she was 25. So I, you know, I took the case on, on those terms, but she wanted 
women to be in the lead. And it was a little bit of a contrivance because we were all new lawyers leading. I, I had to talk to myself every day <laughs> to get myself to you know, argue with the judge and argue with the lawyers and get myself to a position of power. Uh, but that's what, she, that's what she wanted, and we were all doing it together. I write in the book that, you know, I, I didn't look much like a lawyer then, but none of us did. So it was, I just couldn't turn it down. And I, it also, it, it was, you know, the kind of case when you represent someone who's not unlike you. Uh, I felt like I was saving our lives. Sure. We, were, we were both in this together. Uh, life was everything I had in front of me, and she as well. So I, I couldn't turn it down. At one point, it, it, it was interesting. The prosecution has called 24 witness, witnesses and they rest. You do not call a single witness. Why the all or nothing gamble? It, it, it evolved. One of, the, one of the things that's very hard for a new lawyer is to do anything at the last minute, to do anything, to, to sort of be flexible. This really evolved. Um, when the case began, we had a reasonable doubt defense, which was, you know, the, the, they really had not honed on the woman in the bank. They really could not identify her. In fact, one witness identified me as the woman in the bank, which was really <laughs> troubling. Um, so it, the, the, the government's case was not as strong as we thought it would be, and it was going to be a reasonable doubt defense. But we, as an alternative, we were considering, not very seriously to be sure, trying the anti-war effort. Mm -hmm. So while we were attacking the government's case, people were coming in from all around the country who were the icons of the anti-war movement for the purpose of, repre of, of being the defense. And the defense would have been, you know, this is the movement, the war was terrible and this is why you needed to do these kinds of actions. In truth, there was not a single doubt that I would never put on such a defense. There was simply no way to justify the, the felony murder charge with the war. Right. It, it just was unimaginable. But we were keeping our options open, and more significantly, uh, we wound up, everyone underestimated us, so the press and the prosecutor all believed that we would try this really crazy defense. And they, as a result of that, the government had two pieces of evidence that were that they reserved. They had witnesses who couldn't identify Susan, and no, you know, it was pre-DNA and nothing like that. But they had two letters, which were the kind of plaintive letters that young girls sometimes write. And it was to my father and to my rabbi. By the time you receive these letters, you'll know what your little girl has been doing. So the government had those letters, which were essentially confessions. But they reserved them because they thought Gertner was about to do this ridiculous anti-war defense. And so I, when, when, it was, when they rested without those letters, it was clear that the most effective strategy was to rest. Because then the letters would be kept out. Letters wouldn't come in. Wouldn't Brilliant. Come in. Right. Brilliant. It was, I was scared out of my mind. I, I mean, I conferred with my partners, but it was this moment of, actually, I describe it was this Perry Mason moment, yeah. you know, where all of a sudden the, the government says, the government rests, and I get up, and <laughs> when I got nervous, I sounded like Minnie Mouse, so I go, in that case, <clears throat> in that case, <laughs> we rest as well. And then people rushed out of the courtroom to, you know, it was, it was great, except that at that moment, all of the, uh, all of the lack of confidence in me came out. The press didn't see it as brilliant initially, figured that this was a young woman who had made a very serious mistake. And when it, the jury was nine to three for acquittal, and then 10 to two, and then 11 to one, all of a sudden they started to look at me as someone who maybe maybe I did know what I was doing. Yeah, right. You know, so it was really quite a change. And it was funny, one of the prosecutors says, well, you know, it was really, he doesn't say it directly, but it was really brilliant because no one expected you to win. So if you won, it would be the win of the century, I right, think is right, what he said. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a lesson for one of the things that young women lawyers can do is to take advantage of being underestimated. Sure. You know, you, on, on the one hand, you get all of the, the, the sort of lack of confidence in who you are. But on the other hand, there is the, 
oh, you don't think I can do it? Well, let's just show you. Yeah, that's right. So that's what that was about. <laughs> You mentioned in the book that once you started practicing law, you in fact found it harder than you ever envisioned when you were at Yale. How so? You know, I, I, it was um, when you were in law school, when we were in law school at this time, uh, it was the beginning of the women's movement, the second wave of the women's movement. And we were constantly correcting people who were, you know, calling women girls and making sexist comments. And you would go up to the, to the, to the, to the other law students and say, oh, you know, you shouldn't say that or go up to the judge. By the way, I think that that's an inappropriate way of describing it. You know, we were incredibly out there. When I got into court, Suffolk Superior Court, the Boston Munici Municipal Court, uh, people were saying things to me that were so outrageous. It, it, it wasn't a matter of a minor correction as we were doing with our colleagues at Yale. It was a profound lack of respect that I was feeling that I had never felt before. I mean, I describe in the book about people, you know, you'd go to the judge with a, another woman sitting next to you and you'd say, judge, can she sit with me? And he'd say out loud, gee, I thought one woman in a courtroom was bad enough. And I, it, it, I can't tell you how discombobulating that is because you're, it's like he is at such a distance from respect. It, you don't even know where to begin. And you're now a lawyer, a supplicant in his court. Uh, what do you do? Do you, you know, uh, d tell him that uh, this is an outrageous thing, and you just start, uh, you know, how do you, do you confront him and then look like a humorless feminist? Uh, what happened? The good news of that is that I figured out that my best bet was to be funny, and I could, I could be funny. You know, I could make fun of the situation, and that was the best way. Sometimes fun with funny is not exactly right. It's funny with an edge. I, I had actually forgotten this, but someone reminded me that once when a judge said, what shall I call you, Miss, Mrs., or Mrs., and I said, uh, counselor would be fine. And there were titters in the courtroom, and the judge just sort of slunk in his seat. <laughs> but you had to figure out the strategies. Yeah. And it, as I said, it was such a distance from respect that what we saw in Yale was just minor in comparison. I describe in the book, it was like sitting in, in back of a guy with a hat. And at Yale, you tap the guy on his shoulder, and, and you'd say, you know, your hat, I can't see the screen. And he'll go, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Let me take the hat off. Court felt like you'd tap the guy and say, excuse me, you know, you're, you're, I can't see because of your hat. And he would go, I'm keeping it on. Uh, and it was a whole different scene. Wow. So that, that's why it was much, much more difficult. You grew up on the lower east side of Manhattan. Right, right. Introduce us to your family, your delightful family. <laughs> well, uh, there were four of us. And um, my father uh, was born in this country but could not speak English until the second grade. Uh, he spoke Yiddish. Um, neither went to college. My father, I think, did six months in college, and that was it. My mother never graduated high school. Um, they, the, the prototype of the Jewish family is, you know, uh, valuing education. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have valued education if I had been a boy. Yes. Uh, valuing education for girls was another question. My father had a fight with my sister, my older sister, who has really paved the way for me. Uh, the, the fight was that he wanted her to take the commercial course in, in high school so she wouldn't be taking up the place of a man. Oh, boy. Huh? And she told him, <laughs> what, she gave him what for for that. But, you know, I'm, he was not about to pay for me to go to, out of town to school. I went to Barnard. He wanted me, I wanted to go to, to Radcliffe. Or he didn't want to do that because a girl shouldn't lose, leave her father's home except with a husband. And so the book is filled with what I described as Moishisms and also quotes from my mother. You know, I mean, my mother, when I got into Yale Law School, told me that I had priced myself out of the male market. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, there, again, there was such a distance between where I was going and where they were, um, but I adored them. Um, and I, I write about um, how did I become a lawyer from this? Well. My father and I would have debates every night. You turn on the news, whatever was on the news, we would debate for the rest of the night. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's that, you know, although he was telling me women should do this or that, what he was communicating through his attention to me was something completely different. 
And I think that, that you, you, know, you get this dual message. Oh, women should be, you know, you should be ha having children and getting married. And, but there was, wow, there's these ideas that I really am going to engage with because we're going to be talking till 2 or 3 in the morning. And for my mother, it was we'd finish dinner and get up and she would say, go do your homework, not help me clean. So I would, I mean, again, I was getting a very different message from her. You know, I was speaking with somebody about your book just this week, and they said the passages with your parents were their favorite parts of the book. So I'd just share that with you. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I also think that it, um, it made a difference to my lawyering mm -hmm. because I had this audience at home that I had to persuade, a very conservative audience and an audience that I loved. And what I describe is that you learned how to fight and love. You learned how to, you know, respect and struggle with someone. And to some degree, that was the template of what I was doing in court. I'd go before a judge. People used to think that the judge in the Sachs case and I were having a father-daughter relationship, <laughs> not unlike my father. You know, it'd be, he'd be angry at what I was doing, disagreeing with me, but engaged you know, and, and he'd like the engagement particularly. So there's a wonderful story I tell about my father when I got the Sachs case. I called him, him up because I was concerned that the press might embarrass him. I don't know what I would have done if he had said no, that he didn't think I should do it because I was going to do it anyhow. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I called him up and he, um, and he said, Nance, I want you to take the case. I want you to work your heart out. I want you to win. I want her to be exonerated, uh. then I want her to cross the street and be hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, in a nutshell. That, uh, that's, that <laughs> says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> what is significant about your wearing of red? Uh, well, um, every trial lawyer has um, you know, these kinds of practices, something, you know, you won when you were wearing red and so therefore you wear it all the time. That was a little bit, it was a little bit of that. I was wearing red in the Sachs case, mm -hmm. but part of it also was um, uh, very soon after practicing, I, I used to go into court with mini skirts and, uh, and <laughs> pretty soon you realize that that really wasn't cool. Um, but the courtrooms were heated for men. So I would go in in some, you know, frou-frou dress and uh, I'd be freezing. Sure. So I started to get suits, but my, the way I translated men's suits was that they would be red. So I'd be wearing suits, but they would be my kind of suits. And that's how it happened. And then after that, I just, you know, it's just my favorite color. Yeah. It's also, by the way, a very fast way to shop. You go into a store, you don't <laughs> have to spend very much time. You just pull off all the red. Tell us how you build your practice. A young woman in the 70s trying to build a practice. You take abortion cases. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, what happened after the Sachs case? Before the Sachs case, I was a total unknown. And every time I walked into, I, I, I ran into a male lawyer in town, literally people would say, hey, honey, you know, you're in over your head. <laughs> literally with that voice. And I wrote down all the people who said that to me. Um, but, but when it was over, my phone rang off the hook. And all of a sudden, I had the opportunity to choose, and to choose, which is really unusual for what a 30-year-old lawyer. So I, I chose the cases that I thought I could make a difference in, much like the Sachs case. At that time, Roe v. Wade had just been decided in 1972, and there was a uh, really a, a, a torrent of attacks on it, not unlike today, yeah. actually. Uh, public hospital that refused to do abortions, mm -hmm. not providing abortions to prisoners, and then the usual, the Medicaid, right. stopping Medicaid funding of abortion. And it was, they were all emergencies, and they were, and they all engaged me. I, I can say without hesitation that as far as I was concerned, here I, I was a 30-year-old lawyer uh, dating not wanting to have children yet, not even clear I wanted to have children ever, but certainly not yet. And the uh, Roe v. Wade and the right to choose was me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the you know, be like my male colleagues, be able to date and be able to, you know, function in the world. Um, and the notion that that wouldn't be available to me was, was it went to my core. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not abortion was not just a you know, oh, an interesting issue. It went to the core of being able to choose all of life's roles. And I was 
making those choices. So I, I volunteered for the ACLU to, to do abortion cases. And then I would do, I would actually do interesting cases. There's a story in the book about how I was reading in the paper one day about a, a judge who sentenced a gay woman and said in the sentencing, you don't, you don't deserve to be in the animal kingdom. And that was written up in the press. And I went to visit her the next day uh, and offered to represent her free. Uh, because I thought that, you know, th th whatever she had done, she didn't deserve to be treated that way. I went in and entered my appearance. I told the judge I was going to enter my appearance, which is the way you begin as a lawyer, and the judge refused. I said, excuse me, judge, <laughs> I'm not asking for an appointment here. Uh, and the judge says, no, no, you can't do that. Judge, I'm volunteering to take the case, and he refused. So I sued the judge. I don't know where this all came from, but I, I, I Good sued, for you. I wow, gumption. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it was, to some degree, things that were happening were so outrageous that I yeah. couldn't believe that reasonable people wouldn't look at this and say, really, this is idiotic. So I sued the judge, got into the case, represented her. Um, but so I would sometimes take cases, not with, a, not with any calculation about marketing, I was doing this because I thought it was fun and important to do. Yeah, that was the right thing. Yeah, as it happened, because I was there were still so few women. As it happened, many of these cases got me into the press. As I said, it was not my calculation, but sure. many of them did. Yeah, and then that enabled me to make additional choices. Um, I somewhere somewhere along the long line, I had to figure out how to make a living, and you know, we did. Uh, I did uh, a criminal defense work would enable me to make a living, and I also did stockholder securities cases, yes. plaintiff stockholders cases, which funded my house. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back and talk about those, but tell us why murder cases. Well, um, Sachs was a murder case. Mm -hmm. um, there were no women or very few women doing them. They are the most complex, um, most um, gut-wrenching cases that you can bring. Um, and uh, I liked be doing both murder cases and d doing both criminal and civil cases. As I write in the book, civil cases were oftentimes more complicated. You know, the law sure. was more complicated, yeah. but the stakes were extraordinary in the criminal cases and, and in murder in, in particular. So once I had the breakthrough in the Sachs case, I knew how to do this, um, and you know, and that the book is called *In Defense of Women*. And people sometimes think that the book is about representing women, but actually, *In Defense of Women* was also the notion of putting women in places that you didn't anticipate that they would be, and the criminal courts, and the felony courts, and the murder cases were the last bastion of male domination really right. and I wanted to be there I wanted to be there I want to talk now about some of the gender discrimination um, cases that you were involved in we'll start with chapter 5 of your book where you talk about psychiatry malpractice and feminism and I am glad that you have addressed the issue of psychiatrists and really doctors generally who may breach their code of ethics and get sexually involved with their clients. How common do you think this might be? Well, when, when I was doing this, which was in the late 70s and early mm -hmm. 80s, it was very common. And it was very common then because women didn't know that it was wrong. They knew that it was wrong, but felt power, maybe that wasn't, not that they didn't know it was wrong, they knew it was wrong, but felt powerless sure. to address it. Because, you know, we were, in the case that I described there, it's a, it's a low-status woman who's, who's uh, uh, reporting to a psychiatrist because she needs help. So she's already being labeled in the society as a person needing help, and he is a high-class, high-status, older male psychiatrist. So these were not, you, you couldn't envision doing something about it uh, because you were such low-status. Um, people reported that as time went on, it happened a great deal in psychiatry. I didn't know about other areas, but it certainly ha happened in psychiatry. So then there, there was not only the case of the woman whose um, psychiatrist you know, had sex with her, there was also the woman I represented who the psychiatrist midway through the therapy said, okay, the therapy is over, can we date? 
and then they began to date. Now, that was absurd because you couldn't shut off this dependency relationship like that. There was another psychiatrist that uh, I sued who um, became a guru to this woman and gave her tapes and essentially made her even more subordinate sure. in the psychiatric yeah. relationship. And another one who, I, I mean, uh, the, my, the most shocking one of all was a guy who did rolfing, which is a particular kind of massage, and he persuaded her that she needed vaginal rolfing. Yeah. I mean, and the profession was only just coming to grips with, with this, and suing was enormously helpful to get them to come to grips with this. Tell us a little bit about the Eliz Elizabeth Levy case. Mm -hmm. Well, w the abortion uh, uh, debate shifted after my husband and I won this major case in Massachusetts, which is Do Moe v. Hanley, it's called, which is a, 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 a established the right to choose abortion in Massachusetts mm -hmm. under the state constitution. So to some degree, the right was protected uh, in, the u in the ways we had been dealing with. Yes. The state had to pay for it, it couldn't be criminalized. Then all of a sudden, uh, Levy and another case, Pellegrini, were cases of women who were pregnant, who wound up, in Levy's case, get, supposedly getting drunk, hitting a tree, she's eight months pregnant, the fetus dies. And she's being prosecuted for the death of the fetus. The other case was a woman who, in which cocaine was found in her body. No one ever said these were good situations, or that this was the way one ought to be with one's fetus, with one's child. It was just, of course it wasn't the way. But the problem was that if you prosecuted her, Levy and Pellegrini, for the death of the fetus, you were now creating, women were being put, put against their own, their own body. Yes. And, and, and you know, criminally prosecuted for what was going, for what they had done or hadn't done to their, the fetus within them. What was frightening about that is that it opened the door to regulation of pregnant women. It opened the door to, oh, you shouldn't have sex in the third trimester, and oh, because if you do, it will be criminal. Or it opened the door to, uh, in fact, there had been a woman who had been forced to have a C-section in California. Right. That, and so it, it opened the door to a re regulation of a woman's body, and to me, that's what it had always been about. Yeah. In other words, the genesis of sex discrimination had always derived from women insofar as they were mothers, could be mothers. That's where the core was. The, the state believed it had a right to intervene to keep us in that role, and in these situations it was the state intervening uh, for the purposes of saving the fetus from the mother. Um, so I represented Elizabeth Levy, and I did an amicus in the other case, saying, again, this was not a good thing. No one was saying this was a good thing, but the criminal law was not the way uh, to address this, and the principles that were coming out of these cases were tremendously dangerous. There was also, by the way, a whole other public health issue, which is these women will not come forward for help if they're going to wind up in yeah, jail. Right. So it made, it made no sense, and that's mm -hmm. why that's, I, that I started to do just before, I mean, in the, in the mid-'80s. And she, and she ultimate, in, in a Levy case, what was shocking is, you know, the district attorney's office was coming in to save the fetus. Well, what had happened was when she got to the hospital, the fetus was alive and was well, it was believed. But because they smelled liquor on her breath, they ignored her. The oh, fetus dear. died not because of her directly, yeah. but because of the hospital. Yeah. So the case was dropped and Pellegrini wound up with the case being dismissed as well. But it was, you know, it's a complicated issue. It's just, this is another issue that I will write about. Yes. I mean, criminal law is not the way uh, we should address these kinds of very complicated social issues. It's like, you know, it's like using nuclear war to deal with the, uh, uh, you know, backyard battle. <laughs> and it's just not the way we ought to do it. No. Yeah. So that's yeah. Levy. Chapter eight of your book, Fighting City Hall. Tell us about John McGrath and so forth. Well, um, you know, by, I don't know, I, I guess by the 80s and mid 80s, I'd gotten pretty good at this. And um, um, McGrath was, um, actually was, you, you see it in evidence books now. There's a, 
picture of the Brinks guard on the gurney, um, oh. identifying John McGrath, who had been missing in an the eye. eye. And that was, so you know, you couldn't have had a better identification, arguably, right? I mean, he's missing an eye, and the Brinks guard said, he's the guy who robbed me. But this was a this was an issue of craft. Um, we uh, investigated when the robbery took place. The investigation, and we cross-examined the police officers who all insisted that it was bright light at the time of, uh, that they could see what was going on and, and the Brinks guard could see who had robbed him. Um, other officers had conceded that it was dusk. So uh, when, when McGrath was found a couple of blocks away, they said it was dusk. So there was something about the robbery had taken place at one time and his apprehension had taken place at another time. Unless they were in different time zones, this, they got the wrong guy. And then my investigator, who was Susan Sachs's lover, uh, it was, she found that there had been, there was one car that had left the bank, the, Brinks, the site of the Brinks robbery, and wound up being caught in the crossfire of the shooting. And a second car, which is where <clears throat> McGrath was found, a second car, and they were not, and she found two separate cars. Um, the one that had been caught in the crossfire with a bullet in it, right. and then the one that McGrath had been found in, and so th he, was, he was acquitted. And that had just happened, I mean, so there's a big acquittal. And then um, uh, when Ted Anselm was indicted for extortion, mm -hmm. the question of who should be his lawyer, Harvey Silverglade and I, who was my partner, represented him at the beginning. And then there was a moment when he was indicted and a group of male lawyers got together to figure out who should represent him going forward. And we weren't on the list. It was like at that point, no matter how much I had won and how, how extraordinary the victories were, because I took hard cases, I was still not in the mix. You were still a woman. I was still a woman. And so the, uh, Ted Anselm, to his enormous credit, said, I want, her to re I want them to represent me in any event. And then the funny story of that is the first day of that trial, Harvey Silverglade, my male partner, is sitting next to me. I'm doing everything. He gives the, the, the news that night had, <laughs> hit, had his face and my words. <laughs> and I went up to them the next day because I have a big mouth, and I said, what do you think I am, so Harvey Silverglade in drag? <laughs> what, I mean, this is idiotic. But it was, it, you know, it, it was, again, this skepticism about who you are, and, and that lasted yeah. even into the 80s. Wow. And he was acquitted, too. I only write in the book about people I, who were acquitted. Of course. <laughs> My book, I can do whatever That's I want. Right. <laughs> right, right, no problem. You write in the book that you were deeply skeptical, skeptical of love and work and lawyering and motherhood and children. Right. Okay, but you become pregnant at 39. So tell us a little bit about your life as a mother, a wife, and a lawyer. I, um, you know, I, I was not, I loved the work. I, I loved the work. Um, and I was pretty good at it. And I did not imagine that one could combine work and family and a marriage at the same time. My parents loved one another enormously, and they were fabulous parents, but she didn't work, and my father actually didn't want her to work. There were not a lot of models um, of people. There were models of women who had careers, but not models of women who had passionate careers. And I just didn't think it was possible to combine it, and I was having too good a time. I was dating. Um, you know, and, uh, but I just couldn't envision this could happen. Uh, it was bound to happen that the person I was doing the ACLU work with would be someone I would fall in love with. It was bound to happen because John Reinstein and I were working together all the time, and he was someone who um, was like no one I had ever met before. Uh, he would, we'd work on cases together, and. Uh, We'd walk into court, and he'd say, Nancy, this is, a, uh, this is a woman's issue. You should do the arguing. Excuse me? I should do the <laughs> arguing? So I would do the arguing, and then we'd go out to face the cameras afterwards, and he would say, you, you know, I should not be up front on, on this. You should be up front. Of course, he's never been able to 
uh, whenever there are cameras around, he can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> now, going forward, but he may have reconsidered that. But, he, but I'd never met anyone like that. And so the, the issue of the uh, uh, combining a family and a career, and not just any career, but this career, was something he greatly, he greatly respected. It was something he greatly cared about. So that made all the difference in the world. And then, you know, in my late 30s, the biological clock was ringing off the hook. I love to say that when I got pregnant with Stephen, uh, you know, uh, menopause and birth were neck and neck. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but the, the, the advantage of having children at that age was, first, I was unequivocal, right? I, I talk about giving Stephen Miranda warnings in the mm -hmm. book. He was like, you know, about that big. Yes. And you go, okay, sweetie. You, there's good news and bad news about having me for a mother. <laughs> the, you know, the good news is I'm going to love you more than you ever could imagine. The bad news is I work. <laughs> I work. I love the work. And we'll have to figure this out. <laughs> so, I mean, but that was, um, uh, I mean, I had to figure it out because I loved, uh, I was not about to stop what I was, what I was doing. And I think that they've all, there are three children now. John had a daughter. Um, who we raised as well um, part of the time, and Stephen and Peter, and we, um, you know, they, we, we all figured out a way of um, letting them know how much we love them and trading off when you had to trade off. If I had a trial, he would be, he's a great cook, he would cook for them. If it was the reverse, you know, I would do it. And, and, the kid, and then the kids, once, once the technology came in and the kids could call me anywhere, um, you know, <laughs> I, I'd get, I, I have a great texting relationship with all three of them. <laughs> so, you know, it is wherever you are, how are you? Or then yeah. there's a wonderful story about once I was in China and uh, uh, Peter uh, called me from China, called me and t to find out where his soccer shoes were. And I knew. <laughs> I knew. I knew. It. So it, we had figured out a way of mothering, which was not my mother's way but was comfortable for us and, and, you know, I think it worked. I think it's a question of how much you want it. Yes. You know, how much you want it and what your, um, what your situation allows. And I like to tell young women that it still shouldn't be private negotiation. As a society, we should support this. It shouldn't be the happenstance of who I happen to marry and when I happen to have children. Yes. Society should support women making these choices. I was just very lucky that I could do this. My favorite passage in the book, I'm going to ask you to read. You say that you become your mother. Mm. So if I may ask you if you would read a paragraph from your sure. book. Sure. So it goes, that was then, this was now. Now I had that family, Sarah, Stephen, Peter, Rachel, one dog, then two, a cat, a bird, two fish named Bush and Quail by Stephen. And in the twilight of the day, rattling around our house in Brookline, making brisket of beef or cookies from the recipes I had salvaged after Sadie's death, reciting her words to my babies, I was my mother, plain and simple. I could not be home in the afternoon as she had been to cheer every grade, console every disappointment. She never taught me to cook or babysit, but she taught me how to love. And loving these children with abandon was her greatest legacy. A wonderful, wonderful passage. Tell us about the woman that you represented who was accused of murdering her, her husband and then the battered woman's defense. Um, Lisa Grimshaw called me when, um, after Stephen was born and I turned her down. She was in jail um, awaiting uh, trial. And then she called me after, uh, when I was pregnant with Peter and I turned her down. And she waited. Here was the story. She, um, she had been beaten by her husband, by boyfriends before her, by her father. And she had left this particular husband. But unlike usual, with usual battered women, you know, where a woman has, has hard time leaving, she actually had left. But he kept on coming back, mm -hmm. and he kept on appearing and he would break in the wind th through the window and he would break down the door so she never felt safe anywhere they had a son together and she had to interact with him and on the evening of the murder 
uh, she went to pick up her son and there was a fight over the son and she thought that he had gotten her keys. She grabbed her son and ran back to the apartment and she spent the evening waiting for him to break in as he had done countless times before. And instead by a couple of hours in at what she's waiting literally trembling waiting for him to come in a man that she'd been dating not a very nice man but a man that she'd been dating comes in with a friend of his and she tells him the story and he says we'll just do it it was not at all clear what it meant mm -hmm. and they went to pick up the husband and he was beaten to death by these other guys while she was there it was a difficult battered women's syndrome claim. The battered women's syndrome had never been uh, introduced in Massachusetts right. at, all, at all before then. And it was a claim that um, for women who are beaten, who uh, expect violence at every term, self-defense meant something different than uh, uh, something different than it did in the usual case. In other words, in the usual case, the usual self-defense is usually defined as male in male terms, which is, are you facing uh, threat of bodily injury? Um, have you used all F, all resources to avoid it? And usually, a man comes to that kind of situation very different than a woman. A man would regard a threat of imminent bodily injury different. He would also have different sense of what he can do to escape mm -hmm. than a woman would. Mm -hmm. And so battered woman syndrome was one way of suggesting was a syndrome that women much like uh, uh, returning soldiers from Vietnam would have where they would have a different view of what the danger was and what the alternatives were based on what they had been through and by that point in other parts of the country there was an effort to use this defense yes. to explain why they did what they did um, and I wanted to use it in, in Lisa Grimshaw's case. There was difficult, it was not easy because there had been a period of time between the last beating and the time of the murder. But it seemed to me that that was for the jury to decide. Let the jury hear what her, her makeup was, let, her, let them understand what she had gone through, and then they can decide whether it was first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter, or an acquittal. It was for them to decide, and luckily the judge let me um, use that defense. Um, it, was, um, it was a stunning defense because the prosecutor, in fact, challenged whether she had been beaten at all, which was a very big mistake. So we were able to show to the jury, uh, describe to the jury, you know, getting out of her car with a friend of hers after they had separated and him walking up to her and punching her in the face. Uh -huh as if he, it was he, something he could do with impunity. Mm -hmm. Just, he could do that. Or the story of him breaking through a window and you know, punching her and she winds up losing her teeth. Um, we had doctor's records, we had uh, witnesses, and we had an expert who'd talk about what's the impact of this kind of life on your perceptions. Um, and uh, the, the, we went through that. The result was a manslaughter conviction, not first degree murder, which I regarded as a victory. But then the judge gave her the maximum, which was outrageous. Um, uh, no one, you, you know, the man who kills his wife after you, he finds out that she uh, has been sleeping with someone else, didn't get 20 years. No. Um, you know, somehow it was clear that the values that I've been struggling against all my life were now coming to play in this courtroom. He gave her 20 years. She ultimately gets out with less than that because um, there had been a movement at this point at Framingham. There were numbers of women who were in because of killing their abusive yes. uh, uh, husbands or lovers, and she essentially, a little bit more detailed than that, got out as, as we got early parole as a result of that. Um, so that's the Lisa Grimshaw story, but what, by that point, um, I, um, you know, I write about representing her while I had now two children at home, doing the closing argument, looking over and seeing I had baby vomit on my shoulder, <laughs> uh, you know, and you just, uh, you just learn to get on through. And then also, my, I, I could relate to the women that I was talking to in a way that I 
actually hadn't been able to before. You know, they were her na I could talk to her neighbors while they, their kids were rolling all over the place, all the while aching for my guys at, at home. So it was, I had changed, my skills had changed, um, and this felt like the right thing to do, even though I had these kids at home. <laughs> oh, wow. Tell us about the young man you represent who is accused of, of rape, and tell me why you view rape as such a different type of a crime. When I won the Sachs case, or essentially won the Sachs mm -hmm. case, all of a sudden, my phone rang off the hook. And the people who were calling me in criminal cases, for the most part, were men accused of rape. And it, this was now in 1970. And it occurred to me that this was, they were not asking me to represent them because I was the best lawyer in Boston. They were asking me to represent them because I was a woman. And they wanted, they wanted my symbolism and not just my skills. And what I felt was my symbolism, my essence, is mine. And I was going to use that in the cases that I cared about. I didn't want to use it in every case. I wanted to align it with the cases that I cared about. What I say is that if these guys couldn't have gotten a lawyer anywhere in the galaxy, then ethically I would have had to represent them. But that really wasn't the case. There were plenty of lawyers out there. Then when I had uh, two baby boys and daughter, the son of uh, uh, the son of a friend of a friend of mine needed representation for having been accused of raping uh, a woman at college. Um, the circumstances were very troubling um, from the point of view of, of him. If he was a, it was a virgin. This was his first sexual encounter. He was very small. He's 4'11". Uh, the woman, after this first sexual encounter, uh, invited him to her parents' house. Um, I mean, behavior not just incon not just a little bit inconsistent with having been raped, but totally inconsistent with having been raped and didn't surface the accusation until some 10 months afterwards. And even then, the circumstances were not clear. I talked to him with my little boys running around. And I, uh, I, I thought it was important. I felt he needed help to get out from under this really horrible accusation of rape. He, at that point, had been suspended from school mm. because as soon as the mm -hmm. hint of it happened, mm -hmm. um, I still didn't represent him at the trial. My partner represented him at the trial. He was convicted. I was appalled. Um, they went jury wave, and the judge literally said, I have no choice but to convict you. And that could only be interpreted as he didn't want to take the heat the public that would heat. happen if he didn't, because yeah. uh, the evidence was unbelievably thin. So. He was convicted, and I did the appeal, and I did a feminist brief. I did a feminist brief saying we shouldn't trade all these years when women were, were, were questioned and women weren't believed to the opposite, where, in fact, women are always believed. I mean, we had to come up with something in between, and innocence mattered. I write in the book that after this case, I was picketed for having represented the guy who was accused of rape. but. We won the appeal um, in a decision, actually, that went further than I wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, it, to some degree, it underscored my feelings about not wanting to take rape cases, because once you get in a case, you have to do everything. Yes. And this decision went further in the direction of uh, making it harder to bring these charges than I wanted it to be. You worked, though, on rape shield laws after yes, that. Yes, before that. Before that. Yeah. No, I had, I had you know, the, when, when rape was sort of the, was the crime that embodied all the worst attitudes about women. If a woman had, had been sexually active before she was raped, she would be cross-examined uh, as if she had consent. Once, once you were no longer a virgin, you consented to everything. Right. You know, and her sexual history would become fodder for the cross-examination. So I worked to stop that, to make sure that the only thing that could be surfaced was things having to do with what she did with that defendant 
and not necessarily every sexual encounter she'd ever had in her life. Her prior sexual history shouldn't be fodder for cross-examination because it embodied a, really a different world. My father would tell me, don't dress like that. Um, you know, I wouldn't tell my daughter that. It was a different world and the mores were different and it no longer meant that once you had had sex, you were consenting to every sexual encounter thereafter. I mean, the mores had changed, the court had to change, and the court had to change to be able to recognize date rape. And the only way to do this was to change the rape shield, was to enact rape shield laws. Rape shields suggest that you're shielded, certain information is shielded from the, the jury's view. One chapter in your book, sexual harassment pays, <laughs> sexual discrimination does not. Tell us about the truly horrific sexual harassment claims against the national brokerage firm and your representation. Um, I, I think I was in the middle of a murder trial. I was always in the middle of a murder trial. I was doing murder and discrimination at the same time. <coughs> and um, a woman came to me who had a case against Merrill Lynch. And she described that when she was initially a, a young broker, Merrill Lynch would, was all male, and you would, uh, there would be parties when uh, a broker was, it was his birthday, and the parties would have cakes in the shape of penises, or there would be a stripper who would come out of the cake. She was a tough lady, and she would say, all right, I'm going to take this. She shouldn't have to take it, but I'm going to take it as long as it didn't matter to my ultimate, the money I was making. Uh -huh. If it didn't matter in terms of money, I will take it. And she took it, and she took it. And then she began to realize that in fact, that to some degree, the same attitudes that privileged that put their finger on the scale in terms of her money. Uh, she, you know, private, th th there would be uh, parties at the, you know, the Bruins or the Celtics. She wouldn't be invited. Male brokers could invite their, their, um, uh, you know, their clients. Mm -hmm. There would be, uh, you know, offerings that were offered to the men but not to the women. When brokers left their, their book, it was called, their accounts would be distributed and she would not get as much as any. And all of a sudden she realized it really was affecting the bottom line and so she sued. Um, it was not an easy case because it was a case about lost opportunities. You can't translate that so easy, easily into dollars. So we told a narrative. It was a narrative that I was familiar with. We told the judge a, a story about starting with penis cakes and strippers and ending up with this uh, difference in her pay and that she felt compelled to leave when she realized that, uh, that this, these differences had been going on. And she left. And the judge didn't award us damages, but awarded a quarter of a million in, in uh, punitive damages. And as I write in the book, I mean, I. I, uh, that, that continues to happen, particularly in professions in which, um, which are sort of like cowboy professions, where there is not a, a unified structure where essentially you make what you kill, and that's brokerage. Even doctors are like that, and we see sexual harassment in those situations as well. Yes, we do. And it's, it's wonderful that you expose in your book the link between harassment and discrimination. I mean, the ultimate goal is discrimination. They just use the harassment to discriminate. It's something that has not been addressed by, by society at all. Well, it, 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 when you think about it, it's only maybe a generation and a half ago when women were formally excluded from professions and jobs, formally excluded. So now you, you, the, the enterprise is to try to figure out the ways in which those obstacles remain. Mm -hmm. You don't change something by suddenly taking the signs down off the door. It takes education, it takes uh, affirmative changes. And sexual harassment was a classic example of that. The signs were down on the door. But if you're gonna keep on demeaning me, I'm, no, I'm not gonna feel welcome here. I'm not going to feel comfortable here, and I'm not going to stay. And sexual, when, when the courts began to realize that sexual harassment was a form of discrimination against women and provided an impediment for women's progress, that's when the law began to, began to change. Yes. 
Now tell us, you brought up education, about your suits against academic institutions, <laughs> right. for which you're going to join. <laughs> right. It's a little <laughs> ironic. Yeah. Well, the, um, uh, someone once said that, you know, most people can be introduced in terms of the schools that they attended, that I perhaps should be introduced in terms of the schools that I sued. <laughs> um, along the lines of these cases were me. In other words, I was oftentimes representing women who were in situations that I fully understood. Mm -hmm. um, and the discrimination cases were, the discrimination cases against academic institutions were like that. Literally, the first case I brought was against Tufts University, and this was about a year after Sachs. Mm -hmm. So I went from murder to discrimination, which always, you know, seemed easy to me. <laughs> um, but the, these were very complicated cases. They took a lot of resources. Um, women sometimes don't bring these cases because they're too expensive. And if you are like me and willing to work for a song, mm -hmm. suddenly you can do this. Um, but I love the challenge of it. Uh, universities have the illusion of rationality committees and yeah. paper and evaluations and at the end of the day they may mask the same kind of attitudes that you see on the assembly line you know I don't like the way I one but one I quote in my book is a woman who was uh, going for a named chair and one of the members of the committee literally said you know I I just can't see her in that position I can't see her why can't you see her in that position because you envision a man in that that's position. right that's right uh, so I, I sued most of the major institutions in the Northeast. Not Yale, because I was going there, but certainly Harvard. And one of the last cases I took was representing Claire Dalton, who was suing Harvard Law School for gender discrimination. So there's a certain irony <laughs> about this. It is so crucial that women are on tenure track positions in academic institutions. It's Well, it, it's... Um, uh, it, it, when you talk about role model, it, it, it's not an illusion. Um, you feel confident if you, young woman, can envision yourself in these roles. And if you don't have women in these roles, then you can't expect young women to, they'll come to the school perhaps, but they won't know where to go after that. So it's, I think it's terribly, it's really terribly important. Uh, many of the schools changed in terms of tenure, although the numbers yes. are still not fabulous. September 2011 concludes Nancy Gertner's time on the bench. She's been on the bench for 17 years, but she felt that it was time to do more things with her life before she retires. We wish her great success in all that she does. So until next time, I want you to stand up for those who cannot advocate for themselves, believe in what you're doing, and most of all, you be well. You know, I want, when I finally got sworn in, I wanted people to understand that I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. And that um, there, are, there, should, there are lots of different roads to judging. And we ought to think about, that, think about it in those ways. So I told the story, my father had died three days before Kennedy had called me, uh, before the president had called me. And my mother had died when I was 30. So this was the story. I told him that I was going to tell this story. I am now in Faneuil Hall, and there are all these people around. And I say, you know, I want to let you know the distance that I've traveled to come here. So it's 1971, and we're in the kitchen of our small apartment. We went from the Lower East Side to Flushing, Queens. Uh, very small apartment. And I'm having a fight with my mother the kind of fight that only mothers and daughters can have. Every woman I know who I tell the story knows those kinds of fights. You say the, things to your mother that you would never say to another human being in this galaxy. So we were just going on and on. What was the fight about? Sadie wanted me to take the Triborough Bridge Toll Takers <laughs> Test, just in case. You never know. I had graduated Yale Law School. I was on my way to clerk, but you never know. So I tell this story, and, um, to the, and everyone laughs in Faneuil Hall. And then when it's over and the laughter subsided, I look at the, at, the, at the ceiling, and I say, excuse me, I have to talk to my mother. Ma, a government job. 